Hi, my name is Jack Jewers. I am the creator of uh, The Memory Project. We've had a lovely reaction to our second episode. Um, a lot of people have been in touch to uh, say how much they enjoyed it and how much they liked seeing this extraordinary footage shot in the Great Depression, which is anything but depressing. We've been trying to find out a little bit about where the footage came from. And I'm delighted to say that I am joined today by a man called Mr. Tom Farber from the town of Britain, South Dakota, uh, where the film was shot. He's going to tell us a bit about it. So hello, Tom. Hello. Good to see you, Jack. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really kind of you. What we know about this film is that it was shot in 1937, Britain, South Dakota, by a man called Ivan Bessie. But aside from that, uh, I don't really know much. So can you tell me a little bit about the context? Uh, why did Mr. Mr. Bessie make these films? Where did they come from? In, in the 1930s, of course, the Great Depression was going on, and Ivan was, was a projectionist and worked for a Mr. Baker, who owned the theater at that time. And Mr. Baker, I don't know if it was Mr. Baker that came up with the idea or if it was Ivan. I don't really know that. But anyway, Ivan was set out on the streets to film just everyday activity in Britain, South Dakota, with the idea as a gimmick to get people to come to the movies to see themselves on the big screen and promote the theater. They would show these short films of everyday things going on in Britain during that summer. And I think it actually was over a couple of years. I don't think it was just one summer. And it worked. It, it brought people into the theater, and you've seen some of the films where he's obviously shooting them on the camera, and they're ducking and running away, you know, it's kind of funny, but people also came out to see who, who was actually on the film that week and everything, and it was, it was quite successful, as I understand it. That's wonderful. So, so the films were, they were made for the cinema. It wasn't just a kind of personal project. They were like made 16 millimeter films. And it's, it's kind of amazing that they're, they came to light. And, and I don't know if you know the story, how they, how they came to light. No, please tell it. I bought the theater in 1987. We opened it in 1988. But prior to 87, that August, Mr. Bessie, had a sale of everything that he could sell from the theater because it was closed. He closed it in 1985, so it sat empty. Films were in the auction for that sale. They were sold to an individual from Texas, and there, the guy in Texas, as I understand it, called Rick Pralinger. We use a lot of his uh, public domain films in the series. Um, sure. Yeah, amazing fellow, yeah. Well, well Rick, bought those films, as I understand it, and he showed them to a small theater in New York City, and an article ended up in the New Yorker magazine, and from that, a former Britain resident from here heard about this and said, I've got to go see these films. So she was in New York City, contacted Rick or whatever, went and saw these films. She was blown away because in that, one of those films, was her sister who had Down syndrome and died very young and she hardly had any recollection of her at all. Wow. And, and she was just blown away and, and said, she had never knew anything about these films because she was a little girl in the, in the, or maybe it was even before she was born. I, I don't recall. He saw these films and said, we've got to get these back to Britain. And so in, this was in 1991, we got those films back here in Britain and had a film fest of the 30s, because most people had forgotten about those films as well, and I didn't know anything about them. And the fact that they survived, they were in the basement of the theater for all those years, which was cool and didn't do any damage to them. So when, when we had this film fest of the 30s, Rick came out from New York City, and we actually played the original films on a projector that he brought and had it here in the theater at that time. Oh, wow. Ivan actually narrated the first, the first movie of showing that we had. So many people that were in the audience watching were commenting and saying, well, that's my Uncle Joe, or that's Grandpa Fred, or whatever. Ivan got upset because they weren't paying attention to him. <laughs> and so he didn't, he didn't come back 
the next night or whatever. I think he wanted to be the center of attention, which was fine and he should have been, yeah. but he couldn't help but the people in the audience were so excited about the whole thing to see these people that were long gone in the film and, and it's, it was quite an experience. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Can you recall, was there anybody shown in the films who was still around then, uh, who then saw yes. the film? There was, there was some, there's, um, in fact, there's a, a scene in the film, there's two young boys with cowboy hats on. I don't know yes. if you've seen that one. Yep. Those two brothers are still living. Really? One of them is 92 and the other one is 89 and, and they're still living. I was going to ask you, actually, in um, in those films. Uh, now we only show about a minute and a half, you know, because our, our our episodes are very short. But um, it's a nice compilation of some of the nicest, the funniest bits. Watching it, do do you could you identify anybody in them aside from them? You know, are there famous kind of town figures, people very well known locally? Or I, you know, I've oh. lived here since uh, since 1982. Right. And yes, I recognize some of those people that were still alive at that time. Wow. And so it was quite a, quite a feast, you know, for me to see people. Well, I recognize them. They're, of course, they're 50 years older now, but it was quite an experience. And we packed the theater. Wonderful. This theater has quite a lot of history with it because of these films. You're talking to me now from, from the movie theater, aren't you? I'm talking from the projection booth of the movie theater, yes. And how old is it? Built in 1915. Wow, so it's a proper old original. It's 105 years old this, this fall in September. What an icon on our main street because we got our marquee out there and lights up and it's a great source of pride for a lot of people that were able. Most theaters in towns our size closed long ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations for keeping it open. One of the things I like most about Mr. Bessie's films is that, you know, that period in history, particularly American history, 1937, we're just coming up on World War II, the height of the Depression. You know, we don't tend to think of people having a great time. And yeah. yet there are these people, they're smiling. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're joking around. There's a lovely moment where this one lady, she's um, probably about, you know, 20, 25, and she's hiding behind a lamppost. Yep. And then this man comes and taps her on the shoulder and she kind of laughs and it's, it's so touching and so sweet. And it's like a view of that period we don't get. And I quite like that. Yeah, yeah. Some of the, some of the, well, I think Rick Trailinger said it's some of the best archival footage, black and white footage that he'd ever seen. And it was from an amateur cameraman. But I think that's why it's so good because yeah. he's an amateur. Uh, you you can see like you know uh, people run away people try and hide I love how shy everybody is you know so many people don't want to be seen and they're all doing this and whatever but they're all smiling yep. yep and he was obviously a very popular man how old was he then probably in the 30s yeah probably mid to late 30s but but a popular man a man people really liked yeah he was it was popular and when mr baker sold the theater that was in the early 50s and that's when ivan bought it and of course television would just come into into play and things dropped off of course and so mr bessie ran the cinema until you took it over in 1987 is that right 1987 is when when i purchased the theater reopened it in 1988. We did quite a bit of renovation then and we've gone through a couple of renovations since then. Do you know if he made more films during his life? Did he, uh, did he ever have ambitions to, to do something bigger? Um, to my knowledge, no. After, after he made the films in the 30s, he did not make any more after that, to my knowledge, yeah. Nothing anyway that's, that's came, up, came out anyway. Amazing, isn't it? Because as you say, he was an amateur. He was doing this yeah. either off his own back or, you know, he was told to do it. I, I think the footage we use, uh, I think it's October 1937. And the reason I say that is partly because everyone looks a bit cold, but also um, there's a moment where your cinema is visible in the background. And on the marquee, you can just about make out the name of the film. I forget what the film was, but um, I looked it up and it came out in uh, September uh, 1937. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing October, but um, uh, yeah, it, it, buddy, he was out there on the streets on that, you know, chilly kind of, you know, autumnal day, 
uh, doing this, probably, you know, didn't think it was going to last. And here we are getting on for a century later, uh, talking about it. And it's some of the, some of, I agree, some of the most important and some of the best archival footage of America in that period I've ever seen. One thing that surprises me looking at it is how incredibly unchanged your town looks. Like I looked on Google Maps and, you know, it could, that film could almost have been taken yesterday, you know, were it not for the fashions and the cars. Right. Uh, it still looks like this wonderful microcosm of, of, of America in that period. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the buildings that were there then are still here. There's a few new ones. Um, but yeah, Main Street doesn't look a lot different. It is wonderful seeing how, in some respects, it could be yesterday. But in other respects, you know, people, everyone looking so smart, you know, and they're just going out just for you know, just, just for a normal day to do their sure. shopping or whatever. And they're all wearing ties and beautiful dresses. And it, that's lovely to that see. That was back when, when women wore dresses mm. most of the time. Pants weren't apparently a going thing for women at that time. Men wore the hats and suit jackets, businessmen on Main Street anyway. And then you had the farmers, of course. They came in yeah. you know, wearing the cowboy hats and yeah. jeans yeah. or whatever. But... My final question, um, have you ever considered uh, doing something similar to what Mr. Bessie did and going out and capturing people on the, on the streets? Of um, no, I really haven't, uh, largely because um, time, I guess. I, I, I don't know if it would be as novel today with everybody with cell phones that have cameras on them. That's it, yeah. Um, would they come to see when you can go on the internet and Facebook and get so much information. 20 years ago, it was more of a thought, but again, this is part time for me. It's uh, community service. It's, it's not the same era. They were trying to make a living back then. I, I couldn't survive on this today. Yeah, you know, there's just no way. So probably not. Yeah, As sure. you're, probably not. You, you do see how, like, for a lot of these people, it's obviously a big novelty, you know? And, and it takes them a while even to register that somebody's filming them. Whereas now, you know, as you say, with the cell phones, everyone's got them out all the time, you know, it, it's different. Well, and the other thing, we've gotten much more privacy-oriented, uh, legal aspects of it, too. Oh, well, Tom, it's been so much fun talking to you. And thank you so much for telling us a bit more about the history of this film. It is wonderful to have this and to have made the discovery as well, uh, this film that had been lying, um, you know, uh, forgotten for so many years. And that's kind of similar to what we're doing here, is, is giving these kind of forgotten, these abandoned films, a new lease of life. This would be a good setting for a movie of some kind, just with all the history of this theater. Well, well, if I'm ever in South Dakota, um, I will make sure I, I, I visit, and um, I'd love sure. to come when the cinema is open as well and see a movie and um, yeah. say hi. So uh, well, we'll do whatever we can to keep it going. Right now, we're closed with the virus. Hmm. We've been selling popcorn every every other weekend, yeah. just on a Friday night, right? And uh, we had cars lined up three blocks away to come and get popcorn. Oh, wow. We'll, we'll go towards helping keep the theater going once we get, yeah. get back and able to start showing movies again. So there's, there's a overwhelming support here from the community that wants to see this you know, continue. These old cinemas are such an important part of, um, of our history, I think. They um, are. Uh, I think yeah. it's absolutely wonderful what you're doing. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and good luck. Well, thank you so much, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Good luck keeping your cinema going and everything that you do. And uh, we're really grateful for your insight into these, these magnificent old films. Thank you, Jack. From Britain, South Dakota to Great Britain, we appreciate all you're doing. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.